गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन सो वी आर द रिफॉन ग्रुप एंड सो बेसिकली आर प्रॉब्लम वॉज टू प्रिडिक्ट एग्जासबेशन एंड एसोशिएटेड ट्राइज इन सी ओ पी डी पेशेंट्स ओके सो दिस इज द ब्रीफ आउटलाइन ऑफ आर प्रोजेक्ट सो लेट इज जस्ट रिमाइंड आवर सेल्स विथ वॉट वॉट एग्जैक्टली रिवॉन इज डूइंग सो बेसिकली रिवॉन इज डेवलपिंग वन एप्लीकेशन मोबाइल एप्लीकेशन रादर फॉर द सी ओ पी डी दिज आर फ्यू एग्जाम्पल्स ऑफ सी ओ पी डी सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल ब्रॉन्काइटिस न्यूमोनिया एक्सेट्रा ओके सो दिस इज द काइंड ऑफ अ फ्लो चार्ट वॉट दे आर एक्चुअली डूइंग सो द फर्स्ट स्टेप इज लिटरेचर रिव्यू एंड पैनल रिव्यू सो ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ दोज रिव्यू दे आर गेटिंग दिस थ्री इम्पॉर्टेंट पैरामीटर्स ओवर देयर एंड देन दे आर बेसिकली यूजिंग डिजाइन ऑफ एक्सपेरिमेंट्स टू सिम्यूलेट पेशेंट केसेस एंड देन दोज पेशेंट केसेस आर सेंड टू डॉक्टर्स एंड देन दे हैव दिस ट्रियाज डिसीजन्स Okay, so this is one of the studies that we did. So here, the x-axis is representing the severity level given by the doctor, and here on the y-axis we have the frequency of exacerbation. So basically, what here you can observe is um, how much reliable the doctor was. So uh, for example. if the severity level is 1 or 2 there is one peak that you can see over here but that peak represents i'm sorry for this okay but that peak orange peak represents zero frequency of uh, exacerbation and on the other hand if you see the blue peaks they are at the severity level 3 and 4 right so uh, those blue peaks are for frequency 1 that means there was a there was exacerbation and this was um, done in python basically okay so these are all the factors they are collecting uh, using that application from the patients uh, we have baseline symptoms vital signs etc this is again a flow chart or in other words it's a algorithm over there so basically first of all what they are doing is they determined what are the uh, what are the important factors uh, in order to predict uh, the triage level the second step was to uh, statistically generate clinically relevant cases the third step was to collect and analyze uh, triage exacer triage or exacerbation data from the physicians uh, the next step was to train a machine learning algorithm which we tried during the workshop and then validate the machine learning algorithm and on the basis of the algorithm developed ultimately give the patients uh, what is the output of the information they have given okay so uh, we we divided into three subgroups the first group was working on supervised learning so these are the few approaches that we went through during this five days uh, so the two uh, of the approaches were random forest and as well as uh, logistic regression so for both of these approaches we used r as well as python to work on uh, here basically we had few continuous parameters wherein few of the data were missing so first of all we had to see what is to be done with those missing data so here in this two approaches the missing data values uh, for continuous variables uh, in the training and test data were handled by categorizing them and um, the random forest model compared the final triage one uh, as target and uh, then we uh, we also took a weightage of both the triage levels that we had as well as the confidence of the doctor for each of the triage and then for the logistic regression uh, we just considered the first triage as well as the confidence of just that first triage so it is um, not basically both the confidences here this is the random forest model just to go with the introduction uh, it consists of multiple decision trees and then we have we have a weightage average of all those decision trees here you can see the confusion matrices and uh, the accuracy that we got for the random forest so the first one here 
we have just considered the first triage decision and the accuracy obtained was 0 0.63 you can see and this is the uh, the decision uh, the confusion matrix and when we took the weighted of both the triage as well as the confidence of the doctor the accuracy obtained was 0 0.4 over here and then you have the confusion matrix for that so the zeros represent a really important output okay now here some uh, this was done again in python and here we have uh, a, we have considered somewhat a basic uh, for a random forest method and try to see which are the most important parameters or factors in order to get the desired output so the uh, topmost was current pulse right and then um, it is in the decreasing order then there was logistic regression model. So again, going with the introduction, uh, it fits a generalized linear model. And the probability distribution over here will be given by this formula. Here, we have just considered the first triage decision, not the second one, nor the confidence for the second one. And again, we have some results for the logistic regression. Uh, this is the error for just considering the triage decision here as well as the confidence was considered and you can see that this error is 0.61 and this is 0.63. Again, uh, at some very important places in the confusion matrix, we are getting these zeros. The third approach in supervised uh, group, uh, we tried some artificial neural network. So uh, we know that artificial neural network is basically uh, depending upon the idea how our brain processes the information. And so this figure B represents a basic uh, artificial neural network. So basically, it, it is some black box, and you process the information. But here, what we have considered is this D. So uh, we have implemented few hidden layers over there. OK. So this is what we did in an uh, artificial neural network. So we did this in MATLAB. Uh, the network cons constructed was consisting of three hidden layers. And each layer had 20 neurons in it. Um, then here, we considered, first of all, the final triage decision one without the confidence. and. Uh, Going through the literature, we found that if uh, there are two ways to handle the missing data. First, you replace all the missing data by zero, and the second one was to replace with average of each variable. Uh, so that we have considered. And then also, we took the weightage average of both the de triage decision as well as the confidence, and again, replacing the missing data with zero and uh, with average. So here you can see it's a two by two comparison matrix. Uh, so if you see that when missing data was d replaced by zero and final triage decision one was considered, this is the error. That's what the meaning of these tables are. So performance means the error that we have. Uh, and you can see that when you uh, replace the missing data with average of the variable and you take just the final triage decision one, then the least error was achieved. And this was also uh, validated by the R value. R value is basically, uh, you can compare it with uh, what we call uh, correlation coefficient. So we want it to be nearly equal to 1. If it's nearly equal to 1, the result is good. So the same decision was validated over here. So R value for the training set was the biggest one. And similarly, for the testing set, R value for this combination was the biggest. Here are the graphical uh, results we have. This is the performance. OK. So the conclusion that we made out of this was um, that the best way of dealing with the missing data is to replace it with average. And do not consider the weightage average. Just consider the final triage one. Uh, 
the constructed artificial neural network was definitely not much more uh, efficient because if you can see the per uh, performance uh, for the testing data was not really good. But there are few ways in which you can improve this result, one of which is you can no normalize the data and then implement the neural network and the other approach that could be done is changing the activation function that we have in the output layer. So those are the conclusions. And the f uh, uh, further part will be explained with by my other group mates. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. I work on unsupervised machine learning group. Before going to more details about what we have done in this team, uh, I would like to introduce some uh, concepts about the, this unsupervised learning task. Uh, actually, this uh, kind of learning is uh, work with unlabeled data that we try to find the structure in the data. So it's totally different with the supervised case and can be more difficult. So our goal was that to cluster the patients based on the, those labels that we have, we obtained from the Rivan company based on the doctor recommendations in machine learning in unsupervised uh, way. So we, we start with uh, four clusters and uh, because in the app they have four clusters, four labels actually. So we set those to four and we tried with different kind of combinations with, uh, which I explain later. And uh, the unsupervised, unsupervised learning algorithm that they used was k-means that I explain later. And we got some acceptable results in this work. So what we done was that uh, we clustered the data. To, to understand the concept of clustering, I generated randomly some data, as you can see in this plot. Clearly, you can say that, OK, these data are belonging to four cluster, but like this, but how the machine can figure it out. The way that we use uh, was that we use the k-mean uh, approach in which that we first uh, selected the number of labels here. We select the k equal to four. Then we assign the, the centers of each cluster, like here, those uh, the square, then the algorithm start to label the data that are close to each center. So then it calculates the mean, the, the, the distance, and it tries to iteratively, iteratively uh, solve and assign the cluster until it converges to that criteria that we defined for that. So it's the, the whole idea of the k-means. We did this for... Uh, uh, our application, uh, if I want to talk about the strength of the k-means, uh, it's easy to understand and to implement, and it's uh, computationally efficient because it's in the order of the number of uh, cluster numbers and the number of the data samples. And also, the weakness of this uh, algorithm is that it's, uh, the first, it needs to specify the number of labels, the number of clusters, and also it's sensitive to the initial uh, centers, so we need to take care of them. Here is the result that we got in, in this few past days. We actually tried to, first we tried to learn how to use Python and how to implement the k-means in that. It was the difficult part. And the other part, difficult part was that the data that we had that uh, was not that much clean, so we tried to do and understand the data. So. The thing that we have done was that we, in the table below, that in the slide you can see that, we have the labels from the, the, the company and we did the clustering based on our approach and we tried to match these results as far as we can. So these are the, mm, the, the match, the similarities between our approach and there. That's acceptable, I guess, for the first try that we did. And uh, more specifically, we have four labels for the triage in the first row. For the first row, we have four clusters in this case, and we have 
different definitions of the data. <coughs> Sorry. We have when we use the raw data, when we scale it between 0 and 1, and when we use the CS score. And this is, these are, are the obtained accuracy match between R and the R1 company. Uh, I should say that uh, the, the first good thing here is that for the f four cluster, we, if we randomly label the data, we get like 25 percent. But here we, ha we have more than that. It's a good thing that our machine works at least. Then we tried with other number of clusters like, and different uh, kind of combinations between triage. And we got these uh, accuracies. And uh, one thing that I'm trying to don't forget it is that we tried actually for the exacerbation that we have two clusters. And I, I didn't include it in this slide. I forgot it. It was, and we got 80% accuracy, which, which is a good news. And I should say that in our work, we just uh, uh, tried k-means. There are lots of other unsupervised uh, algorithm that we can use. And also in the k-means, because we, generally we have a non-convex problem. Uh, every time that we run the algorithm, it switch to an, a local optimum. So we need to repeat it and to have multiple runs and find the best results. So actually, we did, but uh, it still needs uh, to work a lot for it. And we need to have more uh, uh, to, work, to think and work on the different metrics that we can use for KMIS, for example. We, here, we use the Euclidean descent, but as you know, there are lots of other. Uh, measures that can, uh, other factors that can measure the similarity between the data. And uh, of course, we need more data. It can help a lot the machine to learn the structure. And, and also, there are, some, there are more rooms to, to extract those most important features for learning to, to, to give this ability to machine to have better results. And, we can work on it later. Yeah, I think this is my part. Thank you. OK, um, so our group was, our subgroup was working on uh, predictive models. So the, uh, the idea with the predictive models is that uh, Rivon system wants to predict whether or not an exacerbation happens. So an exacerbation is defined in terms of uh, symptoms. So if you have, in our case, it ends up being if you have two symptoms, if you exhibit two symptoms for two consecutive days, then that's an exacerbation. So the idea would be to predict that. And um, we wanted to predict that based off of uh, vital signs. So we're going to hypothesize a functional relationship and then see if we can do some predictions. Um, so the vital signs are basically you, you have temperature, you have pulse, heart rate, and then you have, uh, it's hard to remember on the spot. It's over there, yeah, O2 level. O oxygen saturation, that's why we have a presentation. Okay, um, and then the symptoms, um, we have a severe cough, a coughing fit, um, sputum, and uh, which is your expectorate, your spit, it, uh, changes color and volume, um, and then shortness of breath. Okay, so um, we're gonna hypothesize um, basically a, a functional relationship. The symptoms are gonna depend on um, the vital signs. In, you may think this is a pretty naive assumption, and it is, to be honest. But um, we want to make a prediction, so we're going to do what we can. Um, so uh, we have our state variables, our, our vital signs, and then we have our observation variables um, as we, uh, as we um, you know, run through this. Um, we're going to use a Kalman filter also. Um, OK, so what we do. Um, our functional relationship that we hypothesize is uh, on the, this page. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to suppose that the symptoms are based on the um, vital signs um, in a sigmoidal relationship. So basically a sigmoid, you know, has uh, a threshold and then a sensitivity. So the width of the sigmoid is, is encoded in that and then the, the threshold. And also it's nice because our symptom variables are either zero or one. So we want to project it onto a space that, that, in, that has probability. And then what we do um, after that, so these are our functions. These are sigmoid functions for each symptom. And then what we do is we apply a heavy side function um, to that with respect to a threshold. And we set the threshold at 0.5, which makes sense. You round up or you round down. 
Um, so basically, we take our vital signs, we plug them into the sigmoid function, and then we round up and, or we round down. Um, and then we are um, going to, OK, so <laughs> let's see. Um, yeah, so one of the first tasks we need to do is come up with the parameters in our sigmoid functions. And so um, this required a bit of work. Um, thank you, Lou Rossi. From the real data, uh, so we, we, we uh, started with raw data that was not, that not um, organized into a comprehensible form. So that was organized. And then also the one, another challenge was that the uh, vital signs and the symptoms weren't necessarily updated at the same time. So we wanted to have them at the same timestamp for the purposes of running this. So um, interpolation was done that to, to, to get them at the same time. So then we have the data, we have the vital signs, and we have the symptoms at the same time. So then we're going to run with that. So we, uh, we do a regression. Um, uh, we do a logistic regression to get these um, different uh, parameters here. And then we apply a Coleman filter. Um, so what we do uh, is, uh, I'm not an expert on this, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to um, update the mean and the covariance matrix. And then we're going to use that information um, to eventually calculate the probability of an exacerbation in the end. Um, so what the Kalman filter does is it takes a real observation of data. So the user is going to um, use the app and then input their symptoms and vital signs. And then the Kalman filter is um, going to weight that with um, the previous information we have. And then it's going to update the mean, and then it's also going to update uh, the covariance matrix. And the covariance matrix there, um, so uh, it does it by uh, using a uh, Jacobian matrix. And then um, the covariance matrix is, um, I'm sorry, that's the Jacobian. Sorry, it, uh, it updates the covariance matrix by, uh, via this formula. So if you have more questions about that, I'm not really the person to ask, to be perfectly honest. Um, but OK, once we have a covariance matrix from the Kalman filter, and once we have um, the means, and then we have the, the parameters that we've used regression to do, then we're going to calculate the probability of an exacerbation. So what we do is um, all of the, the uh, vital signs are um, Gaussian distributed. So we have, when we calculate probability, we have a Gaussian function here. And then we, um, we integrate over all space on this condition. So again, to predict an exacerbation, we want at least two symptoms to be one. So we, our condition, I, uh, it's written this way, condition B is true. Condition B here is that uh, these two sigmoid functions are greater than a half, or those two are greater than a half, or those two are greater than a half. And so you integrate, you numerically integrate over that space, and then um, uh, for each time you want to predict, you put the covariance matrix in there, and then you put the, uh, you put the mean. Oh, that should have the mean. Okay, it should be x minus x mean. Um, so that's where the mean goes in there. And so the idea is you're going to separate, um, uh, you're going to establish a time scale, and the user is going to update data and information in there. And then you want to predict the future. So then what you do is you, um, you take a random walk, and then uh, you use the common filter, and you update the covariance and mean, and then you calculate the probability. So sounds all nice and good. What are the results? So <laughs> from regression, um, based on the training data, um, for coughing, we had sufficient data to, to get something that seemed decent for, for coughing. Um, so we were able to get 12 out of 18 for that. One of the issues with, so we had shortness of breath also, and we had um, sputum color and volume. One of the issues with that is that, so um, we're doing a prediction based on an individual. And the individual has to update each symptom. And if they don't really exhibit symptoms, then it's hard to make uh, the regression model work, right? So if we get shortness of breath, we have vital signs, and then we get shortness of breath 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. And then we do a regression on that. It's hard to get an accurate regression. So we, weren't un we, weren't, we were able to do it for coughing, a coughing fit. We weren't able to do it for shortness of breath or sputum color and volume. So it'd be nice to have a, I mean, in an ideal world, we'd have a beautiful set of data. The user would constantly use their app and update, and then they would tell us all the information. Um, so that would be great to work with, um, and, uh, I, and I assume that that would lead to a better result. I can't see how it wouldn't. Um, a preliminary result. So, okay, we, did, we have a preliminary result with the Kalman filter, and it unfortunately didn't do very well. Um, there was an updated version, but we didn't have enough time to put that in there. Um, but um, 
yeah, so we hope this is a, a, a good model. And for some of us, it was our first experience building a model like this. So, um, so for uh, improvement in future work, um, we had read a lot of papers that had, um, we had mentioned before that had semi-Markov models. And I didn't understand fully the details of that. And apparently, it's a very complicated, uh, a complicated model. Um, but it looks promising. And uh, also, machine learning could be used here. And then, uh, as, I, as I expressed before, having uh, a user, a good user that constantly, well, it sounds bad to have a good user that has all the symptoms. I don't wish the person to have bad symptoms, but in order for regression to work, in order for this technique to work, you need them to exhibit symptoms so that you can do the regression properly. But obviously, you don't wish that on anybody. But OK, um, so thank you. And I should have put thanks to NSF and uh, Rivon Systems and all the people that worked on the team here, but I forgot to do that. But thank you to everybody, and thanks to NJIT for hosting. Yes. Do I have my teammates up here? Where are my teammates? to um, get a better sense of your thinking on the uh, last model that was discussed where you had three state variables and six observation variables. I'm used to sort of thinking that there's usually a large number of state variables of which you can only observe a few. And here it sort of seems like what you're saying is there, the only three things that really matter are O2 levels and temperature and the, you know those three things. And then... Um, so then you have noisy observations of those, and the only thing the symptoms are doing is giving you sort of redundant measurements on those three underlying traits to help correct for the noise. So I'm just wondering if you could comment on sort of the thinking behind uh, setting up the uh, observation model that way. Um, so it's not, I mean, we hypothesized a, a functional relationship. So in that sense, it, it could be considered redundant. But we don't actually know if that's true and so I think it um, I don't know too much about the common filter so somebody could could chime in on that but I think it makes sense to include the, the symptom information as an update because we don't know if our model is exactly correct yeah um, um, we uh, probably insufficient data we didn't have that much data to work with so um, yeah, so one of the things is, again, you had to find an individual user who updated their three symptoms with the vital signs, you know, enough times. And so I think we ended up with one user, number 59, with uh, 20, uh, around 20 updates for each and not necessarily exhibiting all the symptoms. So, yeah, so it, so it would probably be good to be able to do uh, not just user-based because if the user doesn't exhibit all the symptoms, then it's really hard to run the model. So. It'd be nice to be able to, 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 yeah, maybe work with people of a similar age and you know use that information to build a, a model over multiple people. But I, yeah, we haven't looked into that. So I guess that's why the the functional dependence was so so few. Yeah. So thank you. I had a, I guess, questions uh, on all, all three question, uh, all three sections. Uh, let me just start in reverse order. Um, so <laughs> uh, I'll be nice, by the way. <laughs> just, but on this uh, this last section, uh, you you mentioned you ran a logistic regression on the sigmoid function corresponding to cough. Yes. So that was just on one patient's data, is that That's right? That's on one patient, patient number 59, yeah. And so when you said you matched 12 out of 18 times, does that mean that you regressed on the whole data set and then checked how often you matched? Or yeah, did you so, you regre uh, so we regressed, we regressed on the, the data and then we plugged uh, the vital signs back into the sigmoid function and then rounded up or down and see how many times that matched with the symptom. Okay. Okay, so, so it's, it's basically purely in-sample prediction, yes. I guess. Okay. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, uh, I noticed you you picked three symptoms, and there's a fourth in there, of course, related to cold and and cough. Was there just no data on that in the set? Um, I believe so. Is that? 
Yeah. The, <laughs> and, okay. and if those are the three that he found, those are the three that we found. Yeah. Okay. okay. No <laughs> yes. trouble. Um, okay. 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 Yeah, so uh, it could be possible that patient 59 didn't update too much another symptom, and patient 59 <laughs> was, was good for the other three symptoms. I That's, see. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> We love Very patient good. 59. Um, on the uh, unsupervised problem. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so that clustering scheme you had there um, uh, was nice. You tried sort of lots of different combinations. Um, yeah, that slide's good. Um, but what patient variables did you use to drive your clustering? Was it was it every patient attribute, or did you pick just a few? Yeah, yeah. We did learning over the whole features that we have. It's the whole feature set. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's why I said that we need to work over the feature selection because clearly it's some features have more importance right. weight and we need right. to weight them. Okay, very good. Uh, and then uh, a third question on the supervised portion. Uh, Vrishali, could you just go to that section with the confusion matrices um, yeah, sure. for... Um, Logistic regression should be fine if you or you can choose another one. Okay. Okay. All right, very good. And so I guess I have a few questions here. So first of all, did you use all nine physicians in the consensus? Uh, yeah, uh, but can somebody help me to answer this? Yeah. Are you talking about the uh, validation? Yeah, what's the validation? What are you comparing here? We only had the consensus. We didn't have the individual nine doctors. So when we tested in the validation set, it was our predictions against the consensus of all the doctors. It, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the algorithm's decision didn't affect the consensus. Is that right? So because So before you had a consensus number, and then the algorithm makes a prediction on the same case. They're not, they don't have an opinion that's weighted in the consensus. Like their vote doesn't count. I'm not sure what happened. I mean, we, we trained this on the training set that had the 3,600 some cases, right? And each doctor had its two uh, choices and we weighted those. And so then we, we put that and trained. And then there were nine doctors in the validation set, right? And we had their consensus. And so, and what's your question then? No, no, no. I'll ask well, it another way. So, if you. Maybe. So, let me repeat the question. He is asking if. Uh, did you consider the decision of the algorithm together with the majority decision of the doctor? Since the sc scenario here is that. Uh, each doctor gets to give his own opinion on this, right? But you want the opinion of the algorithm to be taken into account the same as the opinion of the doctors, right? But, yeah, I didn't uh, tell you this. So what they're comparing is just the majority decision of the doctors without the opinion of the algorithm on it. Okay. Because I gave them, when I gave them the data, I gave them the majority of the doctors and not each single one so that they could find the majority by including the opinion of the algorithm. Okay, so now, I if that's the case, then the sums of all those rows should be the same between those two matrices, right? Because the consensus decision's never changing. And there's 36 people who had a consensus decision to go to the ER in the second case, and there's 27 in the first case. That's right, I don't know what uh, that is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I think maybe it's yeah, been transferred. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, because, yeah, yeah, that works. All right. Yeah, okay. Wow. Any other uh, questions? Okay. So the, the second algorithm is just awful in, in category three. Yes. Okay, thank but you. <laughs> okay, no, 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 no problem. You might want to keep it. 
Did anyone have a question? And if there's no questions, then perhaps we can turn to Sumanth again for our comments. <laughs> okay, so uh, first of all, um, thanks uh, as always uh, for having me uh, here and, and for uh, inviting Rivan. And I'll, I'll say uh, what I also said uh, before I started uh, this week. Uh, I love coming here. I love seeing everybody. Um, let me sort of make some specific comments uh, on the on the on the content. Um, so. There are frameworks uh, that have been set up by the students and the faculty here, not just for analyzing the data, but for running models on them, um, that will be very useful to me going forward. And so your code will be used. Also, some of the insights that you draw about how ugly our data is, um, is worth sharing with, with those who manage the data uh, in our company. And, and it's always, in fact, even more poignant when you can show, you know, where it's not just me complaining, but I can, I can show them pictures sort of, of the extent of the issue. Um, so, you know, really discreetly on the content, I'm very happy with what, uh, what was produced. I'm also, by the way, very happy that so many of you decided to pick up Python and learn some new tools this week. Um, and you did it enthusiastically. So uh, for your own general scholarship, uh, that's, that's a great thing. Um, very nice job organizing, uh, you know, the whole thing. Linda and Rich, thanks for all of your effort. Um, very cool building. Lots of resources. <laughs> uh, and uh, I hope you uh, have us back next year. Uh, we'll be excited to bring another problem. <laughs>